following program is sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Welcome to About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over $100,000 in net worth and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments, surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared on the following program is for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. And we're talking about the answer about money today. It's Saturday. And we talk about money at noon. So we're about to talk about money. You know, during Hurricane Dorian, Elon Musk announced that Tesla owners would find that their cars had developed the ability to go further because of the hurricane. Actually, it wasn't because of the hurricane. It was because they were able to go into the their Tesla center in Palo Alto and they could add capacity to the batteries. The batteries had been limited for a single charge, but Elon Musk through that was able to add battery charge so that the Teslas would go further. The Economist pointed that out. That's the latest issue of The Economist. And they began to talk about the Internet of Things, and that's where that applies to because it means that not only do you have control of your car, but so does Tesla especially if you drive a Tesla or if you drive an electric car, things are centered through that. But it's not just cars. It's becoming everything electronic. More and more things are being set up as computers and computer chips. Everything from toasters to farming equipment, even cows, factory robots, all that's been controlling. It's, it's into what's called an Internet of Things. The focus of this program has been to identify what's coming down the road, to identify things in the future, not to look at just the present, not to look at the past, but to put you, the listener, ahead of the curve so you can see what's coming and not be surprised by things that are happening. Richard Foster of Yale, I've mentioned this any number of times, and I'll probably mention it again before the program's over. Richard Foster of Yale did a, was the first to do a study, and he found that companies in the Standard & Poor's 500 in the year 1920 had an average life of 70 years. Today, that's down to 15 years. Companies which seem to take off and go can die almost just as quickly. There is a displacement going. There are companies at risk. And so the idea of this program is to put you ahead of the curve so that you're not caught in something that is suddenly obsolete. And so The Economist devoted an entire quarterly section to the Internet of Things. And I thought it was really important, important enough to really talk about it today because more and more things are becoming Internet savvy. You know, it's not just the cars. It's, think about the camera in the car. No, <clears throat> not only I have a Tesla, so they have the cameras in the cars, but it's not just Tesla. Most cars now have a camera. They have a camera that backs up, but they also have cameras that will look out to the side. They'll have cameras that, that guide and direct you. That's not the camera itself that's doing that. That's because the images are being transported in and going into a computer chip that actually massages the image that you're seeing and will lay out lines, will lay out directions, will lay out all those things. It's becoming more and more sophisticated for cars. You know, at one time, one of the big improvements in cars was that little fob that you get. You know, I can remember one time, go back, way, way back, we had a Toyota, a yellow Toyota station wagon. This is when I was young and we had kids and, and all that. And I can remember one time walking out into the parking lot, putting the key in the door, opening the door, <laughs> getting into the car, backing up, driving off. And as I looked around in the car, I realized, you know, this doesn't look familiar. It was then that I realized I had opened somebody else's car and was driving off with someone else's car. 
because they had only about a thousand set of keys in those days. And so your key matched a lot of other keys. And in this case, the yellow Toyota station wagon was the perfect fit for another yellow Toyota station wagon. So I drove it back, <laughs> locked it up. I don't know if the driver that, or the owner of that car ever figured out that someone else had been driving their car or not. But anyway, <laughs> today, most cars come with that little fob. And that fob is a radioactive <laughs> key. And what that's done is it's not just keyed to your particular car. Only your car gets the signal from that fob. You can walk up and if, if I would have had a fob and walked up to that same yellow Toyota and if it would have been a fob, the car would not have opened. That's that little key because it's a radio-activated signal. It operates within six or eight or ten feet of the car and only your car. What's happened is the number of car thefts has actually gone down by 7%. 7% is a very significant number in terms of car thefts. And it's because, they say, of that fob. But that's, that's just one small example. Think about doorbells. When people walk up to the door, they push the doorbell. You know, security systems are now coming so that not only do you have a doorbell, you can have a camera now, a security camera. A camera that not only looks at the person and relays that message to you wherever you might be in the world, but it will analyze if this is a strange person, if this is a new person, if this is a person that's been allowed or not allowed. They will actually do some computer manipulation on who's there. The systems, the, the security systems that used to be when we had our, the house and had a security system, if somebody broke a window, it would set off all sorts of alarms. Um, if somebody tried to pry open the door, it would set off alarms. Today, the computer systems that operate the security for your house are vastly, vastly improved. And what that means is probably fewer break-ins and fewer things that go wrong. When you look at the telephones we have today, I mean, I can remember the old black phone with the dial, even the dial. That goes back a long ways. But then the push buttons came along. And all you got to do with that phone was make telephone calls. That's all they did. That's all they did. You could pick up the phone. You could dial a number. You could talk to somebody on the other end. That's what a telephone is for. Today, you have a phone that has so much computing power that the phone itself has more computer power than existed in the world in 1995 or 1994, somewhere in that time frame. In your phone, in your smartphone, that's the computing capacity in that phone. You know, not only do you have a computing capacity, but you have all those applications that will do everything from telling you when the bus is going to arrive soon, when <coughs> you can make a reservation for dinner, you can use that phone to, to set up and have food delivered to you. You can set up prescriptions at the drugstore. You can set up <coughs> travel all on your phone. And in fact... You can actually use that phone on some cars to fetch your car. So if you're in a really tight spot, you can get out of the car before you go into that spot and on your phone, park the car, not being in the car. And when it comes time that you want to get the car, you just activate the phone, press fetch, and the car will back out and back up to you. All that on the phone. Think about it. Think about the implications of that. Um, you know, products are doing far more than the non-computerized products. Businesses are becoming more efficient. Homes are becoming smarter. Medical devices are becoming more effective. Now there's medical devices that will measure your blood pressure, will measure your insulin, will measure things that you need to have and send that information directly to the doctor or the surgeon or whoever else might need that information. They'll do alerts. You know, one of my favorite things that I've talked about a few times before is a company in the UK that's made a toilet. 
and the toilet will take what you deposit in the toilet. It'll analyze what's missing in your diet. That toilet will then send an order to the grocery store and order groceries to replace what you're missing in your diet. I love that story. I tell it again and again. That's again and again. Those things are happening. Medical devices, the list goes on and on. But there's some issues as well. I read most of the books that I have on a Kindle. So it downloads the book. I read. I'm able to, to bookmark things. I'm able to copy and paste things. I keep a lot of things that I copy and paste and I use on this program. So I might be reading something like, like in fact, the, the monologue today. A lot of the information, most of the information, came through my Kindle. I copied a page, I copied an article, I copied a paragraph or a couple sentences, whatever it might have been, <laughs> put it together, I put it into a Word document, I sent, actually send it by email to my email address, copy that, put it into a Word document, save that Word document, and I have a long list of books that I've read. I probably read a couple books a month, and I probably read 10 or 15 different, no, I think it's 23 actually, <laughs> newsprint or, or magazines that I read every month. And if I find something that's of real interest, I will copy it and paste it. And we're coming to commercial break. Don't go away because we've got more to come. More about money coming up with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I've been talking about the Internet of Things. It's the coming thing. It's going to be dominating our lives. I was talking about the Kindle and what I do with my Kindle and when I read. So for me... It's been a great resource for me. Microsoft came out with the ebook, but it wasn't successful. Like many companies, if things aren't successful, they shut it down. And when they shut it down, the people that had the ebook lost all ability to read the books that were on their ebook. So that raises a question who owns the data and what can people do with the data? One of my friends is a runner, and he ran one day, 26 or 30 miles, and he comes back, and his wife said, you are a champion. And Alexa, hearing that, started playing We Are the Champions by Queen. No request. It just happened because she said, you are a champion, and it started playing We Are the Champions by Queen. That's the kind of thing that's entering into our lives. And it's not a very useful thing in that respect. It depends who can use that data. John Deere makes tractors now that are very, very automated. And they do so in such a way that the farmers <coughs> are barred from repairing their own tractors. Now, I'm not a farmer. I don't live on a farm. But I, I have this picture that when things break down, the farmers don't haul the tractor into the city to have it repaired. They prefer to repair it on site. With the John Deere tractors, there's a question because John Deere software doesn't permit the farmers to repair their own tractors. Hewlett Packard, those printers, it's the, the old Gillette model of giving out razors almost for nothing but selling the razor blades at a very high premium. Hewlett Packard, the printers you buy from Hewlett Packard are really cheap, but it's the cartridges where they make all the money. Now we have a Hewlett Packard printer, and you know what it means? It means that when a cartridge goes out, we used to be able to find <coughs> secondary suppliers, just take the cartridge in, get a secondary cartridge. No more, because Hewlett Packard now is built into their their cartridges, a chip that if you replace their cartridge with a non Hewlett Packard cartridge, the printer won't work. We're seeing that. 
over and over again. Who owns the data? Who owns the software? They're just leasing it to you when you buy it. You know, and then you got to think about Apple, for example. Their phones, they will upgrade them for, or their their book, their MacBooks. They'll upgrade for five years and then after five years, you're on your own. Who's going to do a replacement? If you own an Android phone, it's less than two years if you're lucky. You know, that kind of software is coming. That kind of repair is coming. We're seeing stoves and refrigerators and washing machines and dishwashers, all that are going to have chips. And we're seeing more and more. The chips are not, if software changes, what happens to the dishwasher? What happens to the stove? What happens to the refrigerator when things happen because it's not updated? What's the responsibility? Who's going to update? date and who's gonna gonna maintain when a hose breaks on a washing machine you call the washing machine people or you call plumbing to call or you go out yourself and go down to Home Depot buy a hose and replace the hose that's a hose who replaces the software who takes care of the software you know who's going to track how they're operating it's becoming a significant problem there's huge advantages to these computer chips. Think about it. They're going to be putting in little chips into clothes. The clothes are going to control the washing machine and tell the washing machine how best to treat your clothes to, to maximize the, the wear on the clothes. Traffic lights are setting up now so that they understand what cars are, they interpret what cars are coming and so they're able to to make traffic lights more efficient. You have robots in factories that can actually diagnose when repairs need to be made. The chips and stoves and refrigerators, there's, they'll tell you when there's a maintenance issue. <laughs> Medical devices like, like insulin pumps, like controls on pacemakers, they keep track of the information. But who, who monitors? And how are upgrades done? There's now mattresses that will monitor your sleep and maximize your sleep. But when things go wrong, who takes care of that? There's even now chips and pampers. They'll tell you when the pamper needs to be changed. You know, businesses now are putting in chips to control the lighting and heating. They'll sense when people are coming. They'll sense when heat needs to be turned on, when it can be turned off. They'll, they'll control the lighting. All of that is making things more efficient. It'll control coffee makers. They know when you want coffee, when you don't want coffee. They'll turn on the electronics when you need that. Um, you know, we're just at the beginning of this time with the Internet of Things, and yet... There's some real issues that have to be faced. And every time you have issues that need to be faced, there are investment opportunities that go along with that. Every time you have progress that's being made, there are investments that go along with that. And so the purpose of this program, as I said to begin with, is to keep you in the loop, to keep you ahead of the curve, to keep you thinking about what's coming down the road. How, are the, how is this data going to be maintained? Who's going to maintain the software? All those are issues that we're facing today. And there are going to be companies that come out with solutions to this. Some are going to be dramatic solutions. Some are going to be minor solutions. But those companies may very well be worth an investment. They may very well be the ones that make a difference in the world. That's, that's the reason this radio program exists, is to keep you ahead of the curve and not, not behind. Not looking backwards, you know. You look backwards, look at, you know, go to a car show. Cars are really fun in the 1950s and 1960s, you know. But if you get in the car, you don't have electric windows. You have a, a handle that you roll up the window with. You didn't have air conditioning. Air conditioning meant you rolled down the window and let the air blow through the car. You didn't have heated seats. I mean, 
When it was cold, it was cold. You didn't have power steering or power brakes. And in many of those old cars, you didn't have automatic transmissions. You had a clutch, you had a gear shift, and you had to learn how to drive a gear shift model. All those things. Yeah, you know, they're fun to look at. They're nostalgic. But today, a lot of progress has been made. And those cars from that time, they got six or eight or ten miles to the gallon. No. They didn't get 45 miles to the gallon. They weren't electric. They weren't getting 25 or 30 miles to the gallon. They got like six miles to the gallon or eight miles to the gallon. They guzzled gas like we haven't seen gas guzzled. We're making changes, and changes are coming with some issues. This program is about staying ahead of those issues and enabling you to look forward and not behind. And talking about that, talking about that, there are issues that are going on in the building industry. And that's my guest today. You heard from him, it's been a couple of years ago, I think. Um, Brian Copley of City Builder was on the program. He was just beginning at that time. Tremendous amount of progress he's made, but I'm going to let him tell you about that. Welcome to the program. It's great to be here, Mike. Thank you for having me. So let's start. Phil, remind people of your background a little bit, and then we'll get to, to City Builder. Sure. I'm an entrepreneur. I've started six companies, all in the Seattle area. I was born and raised here. Um, oldest of three. I went to the University of Washington. Didn't quite finish there, um, but still have the dogs as my alma mater and root them on on Saturdays. And... Um, Started companies primarily in the real estate space and in real estate technology. Um, this company is now three and a half years old, hard to believe. It is hard to believe. Um, based in the Capitol Hill area, we're under 20 people, venture backed, and we help you understand the highest and best use of your property. So uh, we use a new type of technology called artificial intelligence that looks through all of the zoning information and all of the other information that uh, pertains to what your property's value is. It helps you understand if it's more valuable to sell your home or your property as what it is today or as a site to build something else. So I remember when you were on before, you said that you had assigned a value of every home in every city block in the country. We did. Um, since then, we've got more values. So we're now telling you not only what your property's worth, but what it would be worth if you sold it with neighboring properties. So in a little suburb north of Seattle by about 15 minutes called Shoreline, um, we helped uh, inform eight property owners that if they sold all of their properties together, their properties would not be worth the sum total of what Zillow or Redfin or some other company said the homes were worth, but they'd be worth quite a bit more to a builder or developer. And the AI said instead of 3.3 million, they'd go for about seven and a half. And those are closing for 8.2 million in January. We're going to come back to that. We're coming to a commercial break. So Brian's here. He's going to explain why that is, what happened, how can properties that were rated at one time and valued at one price can be worth so much more. It's a fascinating story. You want to hear what it has to say. Don't go away because we're coming to a commercial break. We've done in a lot of programs, and you can find those programs on YouTube as well. We put those on YouTube. Sarah does that. Sarah has been in Scotland for a couple of weeks, visiting ruins in Scotland, but she's now back, and she now tweets. If you've missed the, the Twitter, the, the tweets that have been going on, that's because Sarah's not been here. But now we'll be back and running, so don't go away. We've got a lot more to come. More about money coming up with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I'm here with Brian Copley of City Builder. We just got started. He was telling us about a block of houses in Shoreline. Repeat that and then tell us what's really going on. Sure, so we built this technology that tries to understand the best use of all land. 
And it looks through the lens of not only uh, what's on the land today, might be a home, might be a retail center, might be a warehouse, uh, might be an empty plot of land. Um, but it also looks at what could be built on that land according to zoning and lots of other constraints. So think environmental constraints, think uh, local jurisdictions and municipalities overlays, um, just all of these rules. Think of these as all a big table of rules. And historically, the way that you figure out what you can build somewhere is you have a group of people, maybe an architect, an engineer, a land use attorney, an appraiser, a broker, a developer, an investor, a builder, um, name it, go through, look at their set of rules and say, this is what I would say is best here. And those notes are passed all the way down the chain. At the end, you build what's called a pro forma or an evaluation of what you could put on that land. Um, we put together a software program that predicts future use of land and tries to understand what the best use in the future of that land would be. So in the case of these eight homeowners, what was really interesting is the technology determined that their eight homes would be best packaged together and sold to a builder or a developer. So we convinced them to do that. And instead of getting the sum total of their individual values for the homes, which would be about 3.3 million, um, we posited they'd get seven and a half and they actually went for 8.19 million. That's incredible. That's a, that's a big deal for homeowners. Well, it's great for the homeowners, but what's even more exciting, I think, is 260 new multifamily units will go there plus ground floor retail. So it will contribute to a shift in the development and kind of the built environment of Shoreline that's never existed in the past. And that site is located 200 feet from a coming light rail station. So when Sound Transit 3 was passed for $50 billion to make it easier for us to all move around the Puget Sound, uh, these different locations were selected for these stops for the light rail lines. And this one just so happened to be put in and planned 200 feet from this group of homes. So the AI said, well, that's a good spot to mm -hmm. put all this additional housing and the people that live there will no longer have to incur the cost or may not incur the cost of a vehicle because they can hop right on the light rail across the street and go to their jobs downtown. So it's uh, so far proven true. It's pretty exciting. It is very exciting. So tell us who is, who's using your software. Right now it's owners and buyers. So if you own any property in the country, whether it's, uh, you know, one world trade all the way to a patch of dirt, you can come to citybuilder.com, enter your address, claim the property, and we'll tell you if that property is more valuable to someone who's looking to redevelop that property than someone who's looking to buy what's there today. And that takes about 60 seconds. So on the seller side, you can come get information that's not available anywhere quickly and certainly not for free uh, very fast. What's changed over the last two years since you and I met is we're now also working with buyers um, and particularly large buyers. So buyers who purchase 100 to uh, 100 million to a billion plus in property a year. So primarily late stage private companies or uh, public companies who are asking the question, uh, what do I do with let's say $250 million that's focused on X strategy. And then we take that heuristic of that strategy um, go into the data and try to find the best properties that meet those criteria. And what that is turning into, what's really interesting is it's starting to kind of echo the shift on Wall Street that took place from 2008 to 2018. Um, there are some famous pictures of the Wall Street trading floor in 2008 where you've got people, you know, waving around bid and ask spreads and finding rational clearing prices. It was humans operating like nodes on a computer board. Um, now the humans on Wall Street are cooling down the you know software systems. They're just making sure they stay cool so that they can make the trades. We are starting to see that um, that same thing happening in real estate. So give us some of the some examples of the types of companies that are using City Builder. Yeah, there's a, there's a company that uh, we're working with that is thinking about putting solar on rooftops all over the country. Uh, they've raised a $100 million fund and they're trying to figure out where are the best rooftops to put solar on top of and sell the excess to the tenants, oh, I'm sorry, sell power to the tenants and the excess back to the grid. Um, we can look through, let's say 100,000 properties that meet their criteria and create a very quick indexing of those or ranking of those and say, these are the best ones to go after in the country. 
um, we have another partner now that is thinking about transit-oriented development. So where are all these light rail stations going in? Where is Metro going in? Where's a subway uh, line feed going, right, in this new, uh, in this new area if there's subway going in? Uh, where are the stops? Where will people jump on and off? And what kind of development can be done around those stops to get people efficiently throughout the city? Um, as urbanization continues to happen in the city and cities grow, these questions become more and more important. And finding the right places uh, to build whatever needs to be built, whether it's housing or office or retail or industrial or warehouse, uh, becomes a question of data. And so we use this data to try to create rankings for these people to find the best sites to build whatever they want to build. That's awesome. So there's builders, there's transit, but there's got to be a lot of, there's re, there's got to be retail, there's got to be a lot of manufacturing as well, right? Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting you mentioned retail in concert with manufacturing because uh, the manufacturing industry in the beginning of the, uh, the 20th century was, was pretty large, right? The Industrial Revolution had a lot of people coming into factories working and building things, and now a lot of those jobs have... Uh, have left the United States. And with that shift, a lot of those properties have shifted in value. But since uh, eBay and, you know, people started buying things online more and more with the proliferation of e-commerce and things like, you know, Amazon Prime, uh, people are now going online to buy things. And those locations where people used to work and manufacture things are now being um, used as distribution houses. So you go online, you buy your Gillette uh, refill for your shavers, and those need to come to you somehow and get to you pretty quick because you have an expectation that that's how fast it's going to come because you're the all-powerful consumer. You get to you know, use your dollars to vote and make sure things happen quickly. Um, and those products have to get to you quick. So now real estate and uh, the use of urban real estate is changing because of consumer behavior. That's really showing up with malls, for example there's an excess of number of malls and the malls are being converted actually to housing in many places. Yeah. You know, I still like going to the mall. I'm not going to lie. I've got three <laughs> kids. We, uh, we go to the mall to watch a movie and then we leave the movie and we walk around and look at all of the things. And it's just a lot of fun. That being the case, uh, malls are no longer the nexus of kind of uh, society. They're not the place that everyone goes to meet that they were. Um, those are happening uh, in smaller uh, scale, I would say, a uh, little urban kind of community centers and parks. And, you know, people are meeting online. Uh, my kids have peer groups that they've never met before. You know, they know them by their pseudonyms and by their avatars <laughs> and they connect with them on their phones and their iPads. And it's just a, a brave new world that we live in now. It is a brave new world. So if someone wanted to, to check out how their house or how their their living unit, what it was worth and what it would be if it was combined with others. How would they do that? They go to citybuilder.com. And when we were a young company, we couldn't buy vowels, uh, you know, just like on Wheel of Fortune. So it's C-I-T-Y-B-L-D-R. Um, but if you type it the right way now, if you hear someone say City Builder, we had so many go and spell, so many people go and spell it the correct way that we had to go buy that site too. So we'll just redirect you to the wrong spelling like any good uh, new tech company. Uh, but you just go there, sign up, takes you 60 seconds, it's free, and you get a lot of useful information. And once you get the useful information, what do you do then? Uh, we connect them to buyers if there's an interest. So if you've got a property that is more valuable to a builder or developer, we can put a bid in front of you very quickly. Um, and that is that is kind of part of a growing trend of liquidity in real estate that we're seeing. Um, about four or five years ago, a company out of the Bay Area called Open Door opened up and they offered uh, a price on your property and they would close it very quickly. Now there are seven other companies doing the same thing around the country and tens of thousands of properties are being sold to algorithms. Um, we are part of that trend in that we're quickly identifying the best value for your property. But instead of connecting you to someone who wants to buy your home, we're thinking through the lens of your land. Uh, what could be built on that land? And if you have neighboring properties where you could combine those properties and build something even more valuable on the combination, then we'll tell you that too. We'll say, hey, go talk to Jane and Bob, and if you can loop them in, you're going to be doing a lot better. That's great. Once again, tell us about the website and 
Sure. It's C-I-T-Y-B-L-D-R, so citybuilder.com. Uh, it's free, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. That's great. This is part of what's coming down the road. These things are happening. The, that's the purpose of this program, is to let you know what's coming, what's happening, so that you're ahead of the curve instead of behind the curve. That's it. Thanks for being on the program, Brian. Thanks for having me, Mike. We're going to come. We're coming to commercial break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about the myth of excellence. There was a book that was written a few years ago called The Myth of Excellence. What does that mean? Why is it a myth? We're going to be talking about that. Actually, it's well worth thinking about, listening to, because I use those concepts in choosing stocks, in evaluating businesses. It's really worth it while. If you've missed any other programs, you can find us on YouTube. You can also log into our website and the podcast is there. We are also, we've been asked to display on the Money Show website. So we are building out that. That's coming. And so many other things. Don't go away. We'll be back after this commercial break. More about money coming up with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I want to talk about a book written called The Myth of Excellence, Why Great Companies Never Try to Be the Best at Everything. Written a few years ago, maybe longer than a few years ago, by Fred Crawford and Ryan Matthews, they said that there's five attributes to a company. One was price, one was service, one was access, one was experience, and one was product. And they said those are the five aspects of a company, five attributes of a company. And somebody that tried to be great at all of those, provided excellence at all of those, would be too expensive and couldn't manage the whole thing. You know, they, f they did surveys and they found that businesses who bragged that they're cheap were not necessarily most favored. The, the consumers wanted something that was honest and a fair price, not just necessarily the lowest price. <clears throat> People were looking for service, basic everyday needs. It wasn't necessarily to have bells and whistles. But everyone was an individual, and they wanted to have things custom-made for them. Access. It wasn't just the location, the physical and the psychological, as well as geographical. They don't want to be confused or slowed by clever or elaborate spins. The experience was one that wasn't entertainment. It was respect. It was being treated as a human being. It was having unique products or services, you know. Think about high-tech products that came, the Palm, the Bulb, Blackberry, and the iPhone. Those were all experiences. And the product. Just because a business believes its product is best does not make it so. Even when it advertises that it's the best does not necessarily make it so. The vast majority of people were looking for something that was consistently good, was more important than being the best. And they defined three levels of relationship. Level one was one where there was enough trust to buy the product. That was transactional. Level two is where you actually preferred your store or the products or the services. Customers preferred doing business there. They found ways, the companies found ways to differentiate. They had a value proposition. Level three was the trust so completely that they actually seek you out. It wasn't just differentiation, it was domination. And it was interesting that companies that dominate at one time can actually be replaced. I mentioned before in the program earlier that Richard Foster of Yale did that study, he was the first to do the study, found that companies that were in the Standard & Poor's 500 back in 1920, actually it wasn't a Standard & Poor's 500 back then, it was fewer companies, but in the Standard & Poor's, which is now 500 companies, back those companies that were in the Standard & Poor's back in 1920 had an average life of 70 years. Today, that's down to 15 years. 
when you think of the companies that were dominating in 2001, the Walmarts, the <clears throat> AOL, Southwest Airlines, Lexus, Eddie Bauer, Citibank, eBay, Nokia, Dell, where are they 15 years later? Some exist, some don't. It's an ongoing process. And the investments, the investments will change. You know, when you look at what's happened over just the last 30 years, we had two newspapers in Seattle. Now we have one, and it gets smaller and smaller almost every, every year. Travel agencies. It used to be that there was a travel agency on almost every corner. There used to be travel agencies in the malls, half a dozen today. Try to find a travel agency. They exist. There's a few, but they're really specified. You know, I mentioned before the cell phone. I can remember getting the Palm Pilot to begin with. That was really revolutionary. I mean, that was your personal digital assistant. That's the PDA, personal digital assistant. Didn't really have a computer, you know. That was to come later. Then BlackBerry came along with a keyboard on the phone. And you could actually send emails on your BlackBerry. And then, of course, the revolutionary iPhone came along. And all those apps that you could put on. And the touch screen. Tremendous breakthroughs. Now you have the Android, the iPhones. But a constant change. Think about the financial services industry, my industry. In 1986, when I first licensed, 90-some percent... 95% was of the financial advisors of the, we were called stockbrokers in those days, <laughs> or bond brokers. <clears throat> we worked for the major brokerage houses. Today, fewer than half work in those, those houses, and less than half of the market is in those, those big brokerage firms. They're losing market share. A couple of years ago, they were down in market share while they Registered investment advisors were up 6%. You know, when you think of all that's going, what are the attributes and what makes companies dominate? What makes companies distinguish themselves? Well, the myth of excellence said, in order for a company to dominate, it has to be dominant in one of the five attributes. It has to be differentiated on a second and it has to be acceptable in the other three. Beyond that, it's not economically viable. You can't have superb product and a low price. So how does it apply? You know, I've built Adam's Financial Concepts around the concept that our number one product, our value proposition, is the product we produce. We produce a track record which we publish, which we show up, and which puts us at the high risk category for financial advisors because if you, since Madoff came out, if you put your track record up, the regulators want to make sure that your track record is accurate and true. And if it's not, the regulators come in and can find you, they can shut you down. <clears throat> We've been posting our track record now for the existence of Adams Financial Concepts. And not only do we post the track record, but we put the composite up there and we rank in the top 1% to 2% of all money managers. Not the one top 1% or 2% of all financial advisors, but of professional money managers. That's a significant accomplishment. That, you know, we published our results as of the end of June. 100,000 at the bottom of the market in March of 2009 would have grown to 533,000 by the end of June. The numbers are not at... We haven't finished the third quarter. We haven't finished September numbers. But if today holds up where we are today, we're going to be significantly higher than 533. We've had a significant increase. If you compare that to the Standard & Poor's 500 with the dividends reinvested, this, that is 500, or 458. We're almost 80,000 ahead of the Standard & Poor's 500 over those 10 years. <clears throat> if you compare us to the the number one index fund, the Spider, if you compare us to that, the Spider was up four hundred and two thousand with dividends reinvested. We're one hundred and thirty thousand above that. 
That's significant. That's significant for my clients. That's significant in terms of comparison for other people. That's our value proposition. That's where we are. That's where we excel and do well. You know, Eugene Fama shared the Nobel Prize in 2013 and showed that fewer than 7% of professional money managers actually earn their fees. Just a new article out in the New York Times. I haven't started clipping and marking it up yet, but it shows that fewer than 15% of actively managed funds exceeded their benchmark. That's a significant, significant amount. But over 10 years, over 10 years, it's less than 7%. And to exceed by a significant amount, 1% or 2%. That's where we are. Our price is fair compared to that. Our service is excellent. And our service and our access, we have all that going on. <clears throat> That's where we are. That's what we represent that's what we bring to you and that wasn't meant to be the end of the program but we're out of time hope to talk about the rest of it later on you've been listening to about money with mike adams a registered investment advisor if you'd like more information about what you've heard today or about mike's investment philosophy and strategy or if you'd like mike to evaluate your own portfolio click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com that's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared in the preceding program was for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again next Saturday at noon for more About Money with Mike Adams here on AM 1590. The answer. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial.